But so few people have sat in that chair that you sat in. Did you ever call them up like, and just chat and talk about your day and uh, get advice? You ever heard so- Michael Cole calling Stanley's story? No, I've never heard of this. This, this, this was, this was a game changer for me. Hey, you lucky devils, just to let you know, we've got five new comics out this year from Dark Horse Comics. Nemesis Rogues Gallery is out in July. Prodigy 3 is out in August. Nightclub 2 also out in August. The Magic Order's Big Finale Volume 5 is out in September. And the Jupiter's Legacy Finale is finally here in October. Also out from Dark Horse this year, we have the Wanted in Big Game hardcover, a huge library edition, and the ambassadors with all your favourite artists collected into one big beautiful hardcover in November. Don't miss it. Joe, brilliant to see you. The last time I think I saw you was just before Christmas. We did a... <laughs> we did, don't let me interrupt your lunch, you know, like... <laughs> it's been a crazy day, man. By the way, I'm having a delicious burrito. It is delicious. Man, you're living the life. Also, you're living the life. I'm also very hungry. You know, sometimes when you're really, really hungry, yeah. something that's mediocre can be the greatest you ever ate in your entire life. So um, <laughs> I think it's pretty good. So we were on a diet just now. My wife and I went to a Swiss clinic, not the one where they kill you, like the one where you lose weight, you know. So. <laughs> did they? Did they? Uh, did they like 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 you know blow salt water up your butt and like? Do oh yeah, whole, yeah, it's all that. It's all that stuff. You know, and, yeah, thing, man, like, nude saunas, all yeah. that kind of thing. It was amazing. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, no, no, I actually saw an actor friend of mine who always looks pretty rough, right? He always looks hungover, and he looked like beautiful. You know, he was like gleaming, and he told me he'd been there, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to try right. this out. You know, so I'm on, well, I'm on day two. I'm on day two, so you're not really seeing anything great yet. You know? I was going to say, yeah, you, you, so how are you missed the, uh, the beautiful the, the step, but, uh, <laughs> so the, 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 you know, I, I reached out to you a week and a half ago over email because, yeah. for, you know, usually when I reach out, it's just to say, how the hell are you? Uh, have you heard the latest gossip? What yeah. are you doing? Are you still alive? Uh, <laughs> but I had the weirdest dream. And I dreamed that I was walking in the convention floor. Yeah. And, and I can't tell you which part is more horrifying. I was walking the convention floor um, with my portfolio, right? Yeah. Like like looking for work, like like I like it was a like it was a newbie, right? I'm, I'm trying to get into the comic book industry. I'm walking a convention. <laughs> like anybody gets you know jobs at conventions anymore. <laughs> and and I see you from behind. I'm like, oh, that's Mark. That's Mark Miller. I'm going to see if he wants to hire me. Yeah. And I and I go up and I'm like, well, maybe it's not. Maybe it is. And then you turn and it's you. And you're kind of pimply faced. But the worst thing is you had jerry curls. Like like your hair. <laughs> like you had these. Like the. It, it, it was. And I, I'm like, I woke up from it. I'm like, all right, what part of that was the nightmare? The fact that, you know, I'm was starting this, from scratch or the fact that, you know, Mark has got Jerry Curls. Was this but, your first wet dream? Uh, <laughs> of, about you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> We've talked about this many times. Do you remember the first time we met? Because we met for about five seconds I before, do. We official, before we officially met, like six but, months later or something. If you, if you remember the first time. Which, well, I, the way I remember you, I knew you were going to be big, right? Like... Obviously, I loved your artwork, right? You were like one of the, the the guys, you know. You know, there's that little elite club of guys mm-hmm. like Jim Lee and Mark Silvestri who, who look really good, and you you were yeah. that, right? But but then you'd become this Marvel Knights guy and everything, you know. And I remember walking onto a plane with a bunch of my comic pro friends. You know, there was Garth Ennis and Grant and yeah. I think Vin and John McRae and all that. We were all piling onto this plane to go to San Diego from New York. And I remember you were drinking champagne, and I remember thinking, "Oh my god," you know. And you were sitting with Nancy. And yeah. like really nice seats, and we were walking past you. We were like animals going to the back of the plane, you know. And I thought this this guy's going to be he's going places, you know. And, well, and a year had, later, I, six I, months later, you were at EIC, yeah. you know. I had and you we, shook, we shook hands for a second. You know? I had you fooled because I don't drink champagne. I, I barely drink at all. It was probably ginger ale and a champagne fluid. I'll be honest. Maybe with you. maybe Nancy was drinking yours. You know, it, so. it could have been. It could have been. <laughs> uh, but no, but maybe that that was the same. San Diego. Oh, hang on a second. The dog came in. Come on, Rigby. Out you go. Let's go. You got a two-year-old puppy here. All right. You can edit it out, keep it in, whatever you want to do. Um, <laughs> but my first recollection of you. Yeah. And again, it may have been that same trip. Um, was San Diego Con. It was. I remember that in my lifetime, there were two San Diegos 
that were sweltering hot, like ungodly yes. hot, right? And this was one of them. And I was up, I was in the back of the convention center outside in like the veranda area. And I was going to go down to the marina to meet somebody. It might have been Stan Lee I was going to meet for lunch. Uh, notice that subtle name drop? I was just like, you know. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, it was, it was Stan Lee and, 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 and uh, Scorsese and a bunch of other <laughs> just out. Uh, but, but you and Grant came up. And again, it was hot as hell. Yeah. And you guys were dressed like twinsies. <laughs> you were both, you were both yeah. in white t-shirts, black leather pants, and like black boots. <laughs> and I'm like, look at these two douches, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Grant stopped us at high because I, I, you know, I, I knew Grant, uh, uh, but I didn't know you, right? Yeah, yeah. And Grant introduced you, and I'm like, "Hey guys, how you doing?" And, and, and we, it was just in passing, and, and 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 I walked away thinking, "Oh my God, those guys' balls must be sweating so badly in those pants, man." Because <laughs> <laughs> was, that's all I can think about is like. Wow, leather pants in like 110 <laughs> degree weather, <laughs> you know. But hey, fashion is a cruel mistress, right? Um, Do you know what? It's like uh, I, I remember it exactly. And we only had one cool outfit each, and I remember <laughs> that was a, a San Diego cool outfit. And we'd no idea it would be that hot. We'd no idea we were right. dying inside those right. clothes. <laughs> but you wore the same outfit. It was like it was like <laughs> yes, I was expecting a dance routine. Some well, the pet shop boys with the pet shop boys. <laughs> 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 well, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're, we got a show down at the convention center. Because <laughs> the second time I met you, weirdly, there was a fashion situation as well. Like, I'd just been in San Diego. DC had offered me a job. They actually, I, I don't know if you remember this, but DC offered me a staff job a few months later. And it was really cool because it was my first taste. Yeah, it's crazy, you know. It was my first taste of money. Like, uh, you know, I d was doing the authority and everything, and it was yeah. my first kind of success. And uh, they offered me this. Me and Vin, do you remember Frank Quietly and I were offered the? I have the no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, we got the we got the plane back to New York, and you'd just become EIC at the time, and you said, "Hey, spend a couple of days with us." And the idea was they were going to have us on staff, pay us an actual wage to write and draw comics, yeah. live in San Diego, and you, you know just uh, have it change our lives. And then you were you were so cunning because you were gathering all the guys. Remember at the time, and you said, "Stop in New York for a couple of days, like a fox," you know. And we came to New York, and by the time we left, we'd signed up to come to Marvel instead, you know. Yeah. And uh, but it was awesome. I mean, it was obviously my God, the best decision of our lives. It was fantastic, you know. But do you remember I showed up in a Hawaiian shirt and a pair of shorts, and it was uh, Dece December in New York. So I got it the wrong way around the other way, and I was dying. And your wife had to take me to a leather store. Remember, she bought me a big coat to keep, to keep yeah. me alive. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, man, that, that was a, it was a magical time, man. It, it really was a magical was, time. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it, th there's a reason I think we all came together at that time, yeah. you know, um, and, you know, you, I constantly hear, you know, this person, that person, you are responsible for saving Marvel. And I'm like, no, none of us. It was, it was literally a group think kind of, Zeitgeist. It was just, it was just all happening at the same time. I mean, you you know, in those creative rooms, that every once in a while there's an idea. You go, oh yeah, yeah yes, I, I remember so and so came up with that one idea. But for the most part, you know, it's hard to define where a lot of this stuff began and a lot of this stuff ended. It was just a really, really good mix and a really good. The timing was good. Um, there was nothing to lose in the comics industry, right? We were going, yeah. we were literally going out of business. Not, yes. Not you know uh, uh, the narratives that you hear today. We were we were we were almost out of business, um, and when that happens, you know I, I, I think I think was it you? I think it was you who, who was talking about like you know every twenty years is a cycle of creators that come in right yeah to yeah. change things, and then you know and, and comics are like any business right? There, there's the mm -hmm. ebb and flow, the ups and downs. The the problem with the comic industry is that because we were almost, you know, destroyed back during the Frederick Wortham era, and then the boom, you know, the comics boom to bust era scared the crap out of us. Um, every time there's like a year where sales dip a little bit, oh my God, 
the industry's dying. No, you know, I mean, it, yeah. it, it's, it's like any industry. Like if you're if you're if you're in the automotive industry, you have good years, you have bad years. You have good model cars, you have bad model cars. But you know, I don't think anybody sits there and goes, "Oh my God, people are going to stop driving cars altogether." <laughs> uh, it's a weird thing that we do in comics, right? We, we I'm going to say we've talked about it because we have so many times. Mm. There's a self-loathing within our industry. Um, I have never met an industry uh, more content in predicting its own demise than comics. <laughs> and I don't know why we have that mindset. It's not everybody, but, yeah. but it's, it's a mindset that kind of sells, you know, especially on mm. YouTube, it sells <laughs> a lot. Um, but it was a great time, man. It was, it was really uh, magical and, and, and it's, it's a weird word to use, right? But it really was. And it was, um, I think we all learned so much from yeah. each other. It was like you know? a band, wasn't it? You know, like a band's coming together. You it know, like really, really was. everybody played their little role within the band. But I do think that you were kind of John Lennon and Brian Epstein. You know, I, th I think I think you were you were wearing two hats though, really, you know, because if it wasn't for you, that band wouldn't have happened. You know, like we wouldn't have had the drum kit, we wouldn't have had the guitar or any microphones, you know. Like you getting that job changed comics history, I think. If you if a Terminator wanted to destroy comics to go back and take you out in nineteen ninety eight, you know. Because uh, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't coming from the freelancer side. I don't think it's anything that that anyone else who'd been working on the freelancer side for Marvel and had gotten that opportunity wouldn't have changed, right? And and and, and the change that needed to happen was it needed to become more welcoming to creators. Mm -hmm. um, because I remember going up there and and literally it just it just felt like a closed shop, right? Mm -hmm. It was it was. Uh, and the reputation for Marvel was really, really terrible. terrible. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but but you know when when I um, like my first few months at Marvel, uh, well, when, when when Bill Jemis offered me the job, mm -hmm. I told him I need to think about it. I need a weekend to think about it. Um, and you know, I, Nancy and I uh, went out to the sticks in Jersey, got out of the city, and we sat there, and and, and I'm like, I. Am I signing up to have the best seat on the Titanic? Am I literally signing up to become the very last editor in chief at Marvel? That's how dire mm -hmm. things were, right? Mm -hmm. Marvel Nash was the only thing that was making money really significantly yeah. at that point. That and 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 uh, what Bendis used to call uh, Valentine's Day comics, right? Which were comics that were about the past of comics, right? Love right, letters, yeah. and family and stuff. That was the only thing it was selling because it was the That's only thing the audience yeah. wanted. Everything yeah. else that was coming out. The audience is just like, ah, it's, just, it's just not for me. It's not, it's not compelling. Um, and you could argue that there was no audience because the, the speculators had left, but clearly there was because we brought them back. Yes. Um, but I sat there and I'm like, I, I could be the very last editor in chief at Marvel Comics. That's not something I want on my epitaph, right? And it was Nancy who then finally said to me, she said, well, if, if you don't take the job, do you know who they're going to offer it to? Like, I have not a single clue. And she's like, okay, so you don't know what or who this person, what their philosophy, no. It's like, well, maybe better the devil you know. And that was it. So, so I said, okay, better the devil I know. But I compiled a list that I brought to Bill Jemis. And I said, look, I'll take the job, but we have to do X, Y, and Z. As it turns out, I forget my list. If it was 20 things, Bill had 18 of them already on his list, right? Yeah. Um, you know, things like we needed to start a trade paperback program. We had no, we had no backlist. We had yeah, nothing. there was no, no Marvel trades. Marvel maybe was the only one, I think. I wanted to do an, uh, a, an adult imprint. I wanted to get yeah. out of the comics code. All these things that I felt that were really detrimental and archaic. And they, they were only being done because they've been done for so long. And yeah. everybody was afraid to change. Um, but two of those things on that list where we have to make peace with Alan Moore and we have to make peace with Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they work for us or not, you know, um, I, I, I couldn't in good conscience work for Marvel knowing that there were people out there that kind of got screwed. So it was like, okay, what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to get on, on a plane to the UK and I want to go visit Alan Moore and I want to go and, and uh, visit Neil in New England. And so I just 
told Alan Moore, hey, I'm coming to town. Can I come see you? He's like, sure. So we met at the infamous pizza place in Northampton, which is where everybody used to meet him. Yeah. And I said, what, what, tell me the specifics of what it is, why you hate Marvel. And please understand that everyone that you hate is no longer there, right? Mm. I just want to make whatever is going on between you and Marvel right. And I'm not asking you for work. Not, not here to do that. Just, you know, and he, you know, explained the Captain Britain thing to me. I said, great. Went back, talked to Bill, talked to legal. We figured out the Captain Britain thing and Alan was happy. Alan never worked for us during, during my time period, but I could, you know, I lived with the fact that, okay, we clear that up. Same thing with Neil, met with Neil. And, you know, there was this stuff that had gone down with the rights to an Alice Cooper comic that he did. Um, went back talked to Bill, talked to legal, settled it. Neil was happy. Neil eventually did do some, some work for us and was open to doing work for us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great too, but I didn't go there with the expectation of trying to get work. So, so I think those were things that, if I brought anything to Marvel, it was just saying, hey, listen, you know, uh, you, your, your odds of getting screwed are much less, right? But you and I have had this conversation and I have it with many of our freelancers, right? When you work in a... And this includes myself. When you are in a work for hire environment, right? When you when you're working on characters that you do not own, and you don't control necessarily the destiny of your book or even your career path within that company, uh, at some point, if I'm still editor in chief, at some point, I may have to screw it, right? Like I may have to cancel your book. I may have to fire you off a book. I may have to tell you we're not re-upping your contract, whatever it may be, because that's just business, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the same could happen, it has happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing I promised was, if that's gonna happen, I'm gonna be the one to tell you, and I'm gonna be, and I'll tell you exactly why, right? Because previous administrations at Marvel, like, like you know, books would disappear, people wouldn't be writing anything, but they wouldn't get the real reason, right? And as a creator, you know that you need the feedback. Don't just tell me that, oh, you know, it was this, it was that. No, 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 tell me exactly, I'm, 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 big, I'm, a, I'm an adult. Tell me exactly why this is being canceled. And okay, I could deal with that, it's business, but at least now I have, a, I have an understanding and maybe I could improve myself on the next one, right? Maybe I, I, I could figure out what it is that you didn't like or the fans didn't like, that will help me become better at my job. Um, and there were situations where I did, I'd, I'd have to tell somebody like, hey, you know, uh, John Byrne will eternally hate me uh, because I had to cancel one of his books. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I gave him all the reasons why, but he didn't want to believe them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then consequentially just, you know, spent, wasted a lot of his time on online, a lot of his life energy online, uh, mm -hmm. thinking he was making me miserable. But, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, but most people are, most people reacted like adults. Most people are like, I get it, I get it. Is there any more work for me? Yeah, let's try X, Y, and Z. So if anything, I, I think I changed that, that paradigm at Marvel because he was really, really, really bad when you walked into the place from a freelancer standpoint. It's funny because I remember at the time people saying to me, you know, I just had my first gig at DC at Wildstorm that had done really well. And they were saying, why would you go to Marvel? There was rumours that people's checks were get, were bouncing and all that. Just before you came, I don't know if that was true. There was rumours that the, the doors to the office, these Spider-Man doors had been sold on eBay. Is that true? <laughs> when, when we moved, yeah. when we moved from, from the office, from... from, yeah. from uh, the Park Avenue office, right? That there was there was this on the top floor, uh, uh, tenth floor executive offices. There was uh, the conference room had these big glass doors that were sandblasted with webbing. It didn't even say right. Spider-Man. It was just webbing, right? Yeah. So when the company moved to a different office, they took those doors and they sold them. I don't know where they sold them, but they sold them. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I would have done the same thing. I'm not. I, you, it probably costs more to to hump those doors out of that building. They were massive, <laughs> right? Than to than to just make new ones at the end of the day. So yeah, but that's true. They 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 did it, but it had nothing to do with uh, bankruptcy. That just had to do with with Ike Perlmutter, Ike saying, "Huh, I can sell these. I can leave them, or I can sell them." 
somebody's going to buy these things. From a the point of view, though, you know, that instability was a little bit scary for five minutes, you know, because you're yeah. like, I hope, my, I hope my check's clear. I hope the, the story I do sees print, you know, that kind of thing. But you said a thing to me, you phoned me up. And like I say, we'd only met a couple of times, you know, and you phoned me up and you said, when you got the job, you said to me, the lunatics have taken over the asylum. That was your first thing before you right. even said hello. And as a freelancer, there's nothing more exciting than that Wild West vibe that you created, you know. And like you say, Marvel was back against the wall. You know, they had to try, like, everything was tried, wasn't it, to try and make some money, you know. But yeah. I remember thinking at the time, what you reminded me of was, you know, when Dick Giordano took over DC? Mm -hmm. And this was a guy who was a, a well-loved artist suddenly in charge of a company. And I think there's something in this, right? You've probably given this a lot of thought, but th what's, what's the four great eras, would you say, a comic book, right? And I'll tell you an interesting thing that links them. What would you say is, like, if you think of, you, you know, the, the four periods that people absolutely love in comic books? Mm -hmm. It's, I, I, I don't know. I, I hope oh, right, Of course you know. <laughs> I forgot you didn't grow up with comics. But it's like, uh, <laughs> it's Stan Lee's Marvel. Sure. It's, it's uh, Jim Shooter's Marvel, that period where Jim was in charge. Dick Giordano's DC. And I think you're, you're a decade and a bit of Marvel, you know? And I think what it was, was every one of those guys. Well, was sure, you're, you're certain about those, but you think baby. Mark, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, want to flatter you, you, you too much. Just, you know? remind you that, 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 that uh, some young Jerry curled Mark Miller started during that period. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. they, they really are. They're the sort of golden ages of comics for me, of the big two, you know? They're, and, and I think what they have in common is a guy who's kind of like the guys who are working for them. So you can, uh, you know what it's like to send an, an inf a voucher in you yeah. know and be waiting waiting on a voucher you know what it's like to have a deadline or a mm -hmm. difficult editor and all that so you can empathise with your freelancers I think in a weird way so you always felt like one of the boys yeah. even though you were the boss which was and I think Dick Giordano had that as well you know? yeah I mean and Dick was just really just a really lovable guy right I mean yeah. you, you see Dick Giordano you just want to hug him right yeah. Uh, yeah but I think yeah I mean a, a lot of that Mark has to do with you know, I, I, I don't care if you're living in a in a in a rickety one bedroom apartment or if you're living in a palatial estate, which I'm sure you are. Uh, um, yeah. And but when you're working, when, when you're when you're when you're confronted every morning with the demon, which is the blank page. Right. Mm -hmm. And day after day, solitary work, um, no matter how, what your four walls are, how tall they are, how big they are, how small they are, it starts to feel like a prison after a while, right? Mm. And you start to feel a little bit loony. Mm -hmm. And I think lines of communication are really, really helpful. I, I, I found it was interesting, right? Because when, when you know, all the rumors that I would hear about Marvel, this is happening, that is happening. This, you know, even, even after we were being successful, the rumors, mm. the further away you get from New York, the crazier those rumors became and the more believable the people f start to feel like so so like uk creators heard things that were like where did that come from it is so far off base but yet it was said with such a with such an air of like certainty mm -hmm. and i think that just the distance right has a lot to do with it like if you live in new york and you come and you you were visiting marvel all the time you kind of get a sense of what the place is like and you kind of get you know your 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 bullshit barometer is a little bit different because you know you see the people that work there you go out to drinks with them you can you mm -hmm. can tell if something's wrong yeah. when you're an ocean away working for a company that can be pretty scary especially if you hear something and that you know that starts to fester and grow and grow and grow mm -hmm. um but i think you know uh, the, the fact that you know I, I am a creator first um again you the the battles that were fought that I can't. Well, I, I could talk about them now, but I don't. I don't think it's proper. The battles that were fought for older creators during my time period. I have to give Bill Jemis tons of credit for this too, uh, because I would come to him with the problem, and he would he would he would do everything he could corporately to to fix it. Where uh, you know this this is this is before the the Hero Initiative, mm -hmm. um, where there were creators that were uh, hitting rough times destitute, whatever it may be. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes where we fixed a lot of people's problems and helped them out with their situations. The reason that stuff doesn't get advertised 
Uh, because believe me, I'd love to, to say, hey, 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 you're complaining about this one creator who does, who's who's online creating that they didn't get their share of whatever 10% of a character that appeared in 10% of a movie. Um, you have no idea what we did for so-and-so and for so-and-so and for so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And the reason those things aren't necessarily made public is because the minute you do that, um, then people who aren't necessarily deserving start coming out of the woodwork yeah. and start saying, where's mine? Mm -hmm. Um so a lot of this stuff is handled in private. And, and again, I, th I think that had a lot to do with the fact that I've been in the trenches and I could see myself in that place. Right. You know, you know, what, you know, if, if I had stumbled in one place or another, I could very well be that same creator sitting there saying, you know, I'm about to have my foot amputated. I can't mm -hmm. I can't pay my bills. Uh, you know, can you help me? Um and that stuff, you know, and and, and 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 on top of that, people that created some amazing characters. So what can we do? And and we did. We did a lot of stuff like that. Um, and I just, like I said, I, I, it's, you know, corporately, I could not say anything. And I think even today, I shouldn't say anything, number one, because, you know, it's just not proper. But also for the creators involved, you know, they may not that, want that information public. You know what I'm saying? Um, but then Hero came along and then, then, you know, Marvel helped a lot with Hero and, you know, those guys, they do God's work. They really, really do. Cause they also operate in stealthy silence. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, I, I don't know how we got on the subject, but, but, but Marvel's brands, you know, as well as Marvel's finances were a disaster at the end of the nineties, yeah. but Marvel's brand was really tarnished too, wasn't it? You know, like people weren't super excited about working there. The heat fell elsewhere, didn't it? Well, little heat there was because the industry was really sort of in the doldrums at that point too, but the heat wasn't really happening at Marvel. Books that were doing great before weren't doing too too well. But that, another thing that I'd kind of forgotten because it's 24 years ago now, is you you did fix the reputation of Marvel in a lot of ways too, like the, the stuff with Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman and so on, you know, you fixed the personal relationships. I think the brand became cool really fast. You know, people, freelancers, you know what it's like, we're all the same. We gravitate towards whatever feels like a cool place to be, doesn't yeah. it? And I don't know how you got me to come because you said to me, I was getting a hundred dollars a page at the time, right? I was on an absolute pittance and I went up to 150 at uh, Wildstorm. And you somehow talked me into coming to Marvel for 90 or something like that. You managed to... <laughs> but you, you did it in such a great way, though, that you said, next year you'll be making a, a lot of money, though. And I was like, I believe you. And I actually came over. You know, I thought, he's right. I, I, I'm going to be making more cash at Marvel next year. For, for starters, I, you know, I, I don't establish the page rates, but I knew that yeah. you were going to get a haircut because, you know, it, listen, I was probably the lowest... When I started, I was probably the lowest paid editor-in-chief in the history of comics. And certainly... Yeah the lowest paid editor in chief in any, anywhere in publishing. Yeah. Right. But I took the job and, um, I'll tell you a story. I, mean, I, I I've told this on my newsletter and I've told it a couple of times. Um, you know, we, we went to San Diego con, uh, I think it was our first year, first two years. And we didn't have any presence at all. We had no booth, nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's because Ike rightfully so said, we're in chapter 11. We don't have that kind of excess cash to throw away at these conventions. And as much as I tried to explain to him that, that this is different, it's not like a um, – this is a direct-to-consumer convention. This isn't like, you know, we're selling to retailers. Um, it didn't matter, right? It's just like we're in Chapter 11. We have to be – you know, we are – literally, I, I was obsessed with giving shareholders their value. Mm -hmm. um, and he felt that it was not in, in anyone's best interest to spend that kind of money. So I'm doing a panel at San Diego and this gentleman gets up and, you know, he's very, very polite. His name is Serge. We've become friends since then. Um, and he said, you know, I'm a Marvel shareholder and I have to tell you, I am embarrassed that you guys have no presence here. I think it's shameful that Marvel has no booth here, nothing. It's just you and Bill Jemis running around. I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Um, and he said, you know, what, what, what can you say to me as a shareholder? I said, well, hold on to your hat. I said, the reason we're, you know, uh, <laughs> I always try to be frank with, 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 with the fans, Mark. And um, I think that's something you and I both have very much in common. Like we just tell them how the sausage is made, you know? <laughs> uh, I said, look, we're in chapter 11. 
it would be irresponsible for us to have the booth. And I, and I basically told him exactly what I was told. And he did not walk away happy. He was very, very angry. A couple of years later, to his credit, because, you know, you know, how often does somebody complain to you online, in person, whatever it may be? And then years later, when they find out they're wrong, they come back and they say, I was wrong, right? That doesn't happen. I, I would never do that. I would never okay. do that. <laughs> right. So, so I'm at my panel and, and, and we, have a, we have a smaller booth, but we have a booth in San Diego. The stock has taken off. Well, anyway, there online is this guy. And he's the last question. And he said, I have no question for you. I just want to say thank you. I was wrong. You were 100% right. Uh, tell Mr. Perlmutter he was 100% right. Uh, my small share of Marvel now, uh, you know, the stock went up. It split. Uh, he's like, my only regret is that I sold a bit too much of it too soon. <laughs> I should have more confidence. in it. He's like, but I want to thank you. And every year at San Diego that I do a panel, he gets up there and he says, thank you. And he asks me a question. And uh, we're just sort of like convention buddies, you know. And he wrote, he wrote Ike a letter. And I remember Ike running down to my office and saying, did you meet this man? Did you meet this man? I was like, yeah, yeah, Serge. He's like, he's like, this is good. This is good. And I walked away. <laughs> you know? So... Uh, I, 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 where was I going with this, Mark? I just I went on a tangent, but we were we were. Uh, it, was, it was the idea that there was, oh, we there was broke, getting a lot of money at the beginning, but there was a lot of money, a lot of money a couple of years later. I mean, yeah. you were on the cover of Fortune magazine, if I remember right. It was for 2002. You and Bill were in mm -hmm. Fortune magazine, and they actually picked Marvel out as the the biggest success story of 2002. It was like a yeah. superhero comeback. They, they built it as. And you kind of forget now how close it came to the edge, but how amazingly hot it suddenly became. And then suddenly Hollywood's everywhere. You go to conventions yeah. and it's all movie stars and so on. You know. Mark, it, it was, I mean, you lived through some of these times, right? Like, like, like right after the image boom and the yeah. collector's boom, every month sales were getting lower. Yeah, and lower. I came in at that point. It was horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And, and I would go to Marvel to drop off some pages mm. and I would just see editors with their heads in their hands saying, okay, yeah. so... How many stores went out of business? How much, where are we now market share? And they were still, and Marvel was still doing better than DC, right? So yeah. um, and I, I remember distinctly hearing, I want to say it was Bob Harris saying, well, this this has to be rock bottom. This is rock bottom. We can't get any lower. The next month, it went lower. Oh, God. Uh, it, it, it was scary, man. I, you know, yeah. Yeah. I, Mark, I have no discernible skills. I have mm. nothing outside of writing and drawing comic books, right? You're a good dancer. To be fair, you're a good dancer. Yeah, you know, what, but what am I going to do? What yeah. am I going to do? Right. You know, uh, I worked retail for a while. I guess I could always go back to retail. <laughs> but uh, but it was it was literally that scary. Where all of us are sitting there going, what else can we do for a living? Um, and then, you know, it, it, the 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 surprise to Bill and I was, you know, we, we, we felt we were both very, very confident that. If you put out a good product, if you put out good stories, we already have great characters. Just fix the stories. Fix the stories. Even the even the art, as much as people want to say it's a 50-50 thing. Yeah. You know, Todd McFarlane and I will will I love Todd, but we we will we will be polar opposites of this forever, right? Todd's Todd's theory, uh I recently heard him put it this way, is that, you know, I could get Shakespeare. I'm not going to do a time to appreciate it, but I can get Shakespeare <laughs> to write my comic book and I can get my dog to draw it. I ain't, ain't going to sell for shit. But I get my dog to write it and I can get, you know, a superstar artist to draw it and that'll sell. And he's right about the first issue. But then what happens is subsequently, if there's no story, people don't. We, we're, we were now in out of the collector's boom and in a story driven paradigm. And I learned very quickly that, you know, Listen, you mix fantastic story with fantastic art, you've got a mega hit on your hands. But you can also have a huge hit on your hands with a fantastic story and a good, solid artist. Doesn't have to be, you know, superstar quality, somebody who could tell the story, right? You can survive very, very easily that way. And we did. We did a lot of books like that where necessarily, you know, we had a lot of big time artists that we 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 brought into Marvel that we that we that we started to groom at Marvel 
but we also had a lot of like really hard work. I don't want to say that they're 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 serviceable artists. I'm just saying that they're not the flashy the, the flashy mm-hmm. guys and gals, right? They're 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 just really great storytellers. Um, and those books sold like crazy, you know. Um, but it's funny, like we assume because we are fans, we like quite stylized things, you know. Because we appreciate art, you know, comic book art, we like something that's a little bit out there. But I remember hearing this story about, you know, the Superman versus Muhammad Ali special that Neil yeah. Adams drew years yeah. back. Yeah. I heard that Muhammad Ali's reps, who were like super smart guys, you know, very sophisticated New York lawyers, you know, they didn't want Neil Adams drawing the book. They wanted. Right. Kurt Schaffenberger drawing it, who was a very meat and potatoes, just yeah. regular Superman artist, you know. They said it looked more like Superman. And we do kind of forget, because we are sort of art fanboys, we forget yeah. that most people actually quite like just solid art sometimes, don't they? Yeah. I mean, not just solid art, but also if you have a team that could deliver consistently all the time, be there all the time, right? Yeah. Um, look at Ultimate Spider-Man. Bennis's Ultimate Spider-Man. He and Bagley were a perfect team together. Oh, they were a machine, right? those guys. Right? And Bagley's a fantastic artist, but you <laughs> wouldn't call Bagley, and it's no slight to Mark, right? That you wouldn't call you wouldn't call Bagley Todd McFarland, right? In, mm-hmm. in that's in that sort of bombastic style. But pe- month in, month out, that book was number one. Then they the, then we started shipping it twice a month. Mm-hmm. Um, the volume of work was phenomenal. Yeah, um, and. And that book sold better than anything we had at the time. And it uh, didn't require... Apart from, apart from Ultimates. Well, well, you came up with it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I had to get that. Now you know I'm going to. You know. But you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like, yeah. you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't need Todd. We didn't need Jim Lee to draw that book, right? Yeah. Um, it was just it was just a, the book that everybody wanted to read. The, by the way, the book that everybody predict would, predicted would fail, including John Byrne. Sorry. <laughs> I haven't spoken about John Byrne in a million years, and I just mentioned his name twice. He's going to show up. <laughs> Somebody's going to show up if I say it a third time. Uh, <laughs> I remember you saying to me that was the Marvel Knights formula, and you said, and it, it's so simple, and you said it's so simple people have forgotten it, and you said take a great writer, a great artist, and a great character, and you can't go wrong, you know? And People weren't doing that. It sounds nuts, but you know, I remember Marvel was really bad at the time for uh, they were having like assistant editors, people's cousins, and all that coming in and writing stories and everything, weren't they? It was, it was very, very uh, nepotistic, didn't it? It was like a club. Well, what what, what started out as a necessity, right, mm-hmm. um, became a an anchor around Marvel's Marvel's neck. So you know, mm-hmm. essentially. Editors were writing. Stan was, you know, the, the, the quintessential editor writing the books, right? Yeah. He yeah. created the characters. And then, you know, there was a generation of writers that came in to become editors and also started picking up the slack. Mm-hmm. But then we've gotten to a world where there were writers coming in from all different walks of life, uh, writer writers, mm-hmm. um, and who were being shut out of jobs. And I'll, 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 where this became very, very clear to me was we had just, this is 1998, 1999, we had just launched Marvel Knights. Uh, Christopher Priest uh, writes the shit out of Black Panther, and that book is hot as hell. And he gets, the, the Marvel wants to launch a second Hulk title. I forget what they end up calling it. And so they asked Priest, you know, like suddenly Priest is on their radar, right? He was, mm-hmm. you know, he, he'd been editor of Marvel since he was, I don't know, like 16 years old or something, right? Mm-hmm. But now suddenly everybody's like, oh, Christopher Priest. Um, so they asked him if he wanted this Hulk job. He said, hells yeah. He said, great, you got to try out for it. <laughs> he just, he has like a hit book on his hands and they're asking him to do a bake-off for this Hulk book. And so he's thinking, okay, you know, who's the bake off with? Am I, you know, is it with Walt Simonson? Is it with, uh, you know, Kurt Busiek? Who is it? No, it was an assistant editor. Wow. And the assistant editor got the job. Yeah. And the book was canceled after a few. And again, no slight to the assistant editor. Mm-hmm. But what, what I started to realize very quickly is, okay, wait, so the editor in this office is hiring the editor in that office yeah. to do coloring work on their book. And this editor is hiring that editor to do coloring work 
on their book and writing work and back and forth and back and forth. And it became this incestuous thing that then a young, you know, pimply, jerry haired Mark Miller walks in <laughs> and, and can't get a job because you're blocked out because there's yeah. editors writing books. And, you know, that's where I, like Peter David did it right, right? Peter David was, was on staff. He was actually on the, I believe he started in the sales department. That's right, yeah. And he wanted to write comic books and he wrote a few books and they were really, really good. And he was so good that he said, to hell with the staff job, I'm yeah. out, right? Yeah. Um, and he had a great freelance career from that point on, right? Considered one of the best writers of his era. So when I came in as editor in chief, uh, and both Bill and I talked about this, and the new policy was no more internal freelancing. Yeah. Right. It was it was problematic on several levels. Number one. Right. You have people writing books that maybe shouldn't or coloring books, or whatever it may be, who maybe shouldn't. Right. Because they aren't the best people we could hire mm -hmm. on a salary level, on a budgetary level. It's hard to figure out exactly what everybody's making, because you could have an assistant editor job and you could probably have like 10 freelance gigs within Marvel. Yeah. And you're you're sublimating your income in a way that it's like, wait a minute what's going on here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 it didn't give us good optics. And so our, our, our thing was no more internal freelancing. If you, if you want to write a book for us, it's considered part of your salary. And by the way, it has to be as good as anything else that's out there. Mm -hmm. Well, the minute we said that, everybody stopped freelancing, <laughs> right? A part of my salary. Yeah. But the same rule applied for me. I mean, people, Yeah, people, I remember you didn't get paid for doing... Uh, every, 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 co every cover I did for Marvel, every story yeah. I wrote for Marvel, every, every comic I illustrated for Marvel was yeah. all considered part of my salary. I did not get paid extra. I didn't get any incentives, royalties, whatever you want to call it. It was all considered part of my job. Um... So, so what's the internal, because our, our thing is also, all right, you want to do some internal freelancing. If you're good enough, give it a shot. But then, you know, if you're really good, get the hell out of here. We don't pay you enough. Yeah. Go be a writer. You can make a lot more money, believe it or not. Um, but you, you assembled a brilliant team, though. There was actually like a very quickly a really good bunch of people. And I remember saying this at a retreat one time. I don't know if you remember this when we all got together for one of our big summits. There was 42 of us. I remember counting it. There was 42 of us around this table, which was so big we had to go to somebody else's office. Remember those colossal sure. tables? And uh, I said, we're all going to look back on this. We'll all be doing something else in five years' time. And we're going to look back on this as a great moment in our lives because... We're all enjoying working together. We're all loving going to the pool bag pub afterwards. We'd get a pizza and then we'd all go to the pub. And we loved just hanging out. It was like a bunch, yeah. you assembled a bunch of people who actually liked each other. And yeah. when you have 42 people, that's quite tough. You know, especially comic book personalities, which can be a little erratic sometimes, you know. But it was really fun. And I remember that everybody just gave me shit for it. You know, everybody was like, yeah. stop being so sentimental, you know. But but it really, I, I meant it. It was, a, it was a really nice period of their lives, wasn't it? It was, yeah. it was really fun. Yeah, you know, this has happened to me. I thought it would only happen once, but yeah. but I've been fortunate enough to have it happen several times in my lifetime, right? Yeah. Um, I remember Nancy and I, uh, Kevin Eastman, who I, I did not know at the time, um, mm. had the Words and Pictures Museum. And generally, the Words and Pictures Museum focused on indie creators. Um, and he wanted to do something that actually drew a crowd. So he asked if we would do the, a Marvel Knights signing. Uh, you know, the books had just come out if we would mm -hmm. do a Marvel Knights signing at the museum in Northampton. Yeah. And we said, sure. So it was the one and only time that Nancy and myself and all of the key creators were all at one place, at one signing, at one time. Mm -hmm. And it never happened again. Right. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, uh, Kevin threw a, a small party at his at his home, which was an old bank building that he had uh, he had converted um, that turtle's money was good stuff. Man. <laughs> so, so we, uh, we go to Kevin's home and, and he has kind of like a mezzanine level. And as people are downstairs mingling and stuff, I just went up to the mezzanine level and I was just kind of looking down and then Nancy came up and joined me and she's like, what you doing? And I said, uh, I'm just taking a mental picture because, you know, for all we know, this could be as good as it gets. This could yeah. absolutely be as good as it gets, right? But I want to make sure that it's in my head and I never forget this moment. And again, I've been fortunate enough where 
uh, I've had several moments where I've been able to sort of sit there with Nancy and just take that picture and just say the same thing. This could be because you just never know, Mark, right? Yeah. You never know. The bottom could fall out of anything or you could, you know, get hit by a truck tomorrow. But you, there was that feeling though that everything was on the up, which was nice because because we'd had a taste of it in the nineties of it going down, hadn't we? You know, yeah. so so that I came in when it was going down. So to actually see books climbing every month, it was really exciting, and I think that added to the energy of the rooms. You felt like, okay, yeah. what summit can we all hit next? You know, but the nights out were great too. Like, what what what's your favourite memory of that? You know, that decade of. Uh, decadence, you know, because remember, this is before social media, everybody in comics still kind of liked each other, you know. The- <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's funny, because I, I look back on that period, right, and, and yeah. you know, I, I used to take those mental pictures saying, you know, this, this could be as good as it gets. Right? Yeah. And, but knowing that at some point, at some point, because it's just, it's just the way that entertainment and history works, and people grow up, this group will disperse, and there'll be another mm. group, right? Mm. And even if we tried to get together, Mark, if, if you, me, Brian, if, the, if we all tried together to get together today to do that yeah. same thing, we couldn't. We wouldn't be able to do it, right? It, it, because the, the, we, we we're, we're different people, right? Um, but but I, I remember there were there were a couple of really really good moments. Um, I a couple of might have been from the same summit, but I remember when we were talking about. Uh, Dan's objective, Dan Buckley's objective was we need to make the Avengers. We have an Avengers movie. It's down the road. It's mm-hmm. years down the road. But we need to make the Avengers the number one comic book property mm-hmm. in the country. Right. And and so, you know, the, the, the first part of the mission statement was, well, we need to do what we do with X-Men, which is we put our best writer and our best artist together. And, you know, you, you, you spend the money there. Okay, great. That's part of the part of the solution. Yeah. Then you said, in, in 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 only the way you could say it, you're like, so here's my problem with Avengers. Um, you know, when I was a kid and I would go into the comic shop or into the candy store, wherever it was that you bought your books, and I would see a Superman book, and I'd see a Wonder Woman book, and I'd see a Batman book, but then I saw the Justice League. And being a cheap Scottish boy, as you were, you, cool. you said, I mean, tell me if I'm messing this oh, up. Oh, that's 100% true. But yeah. you, said, you said, you know what? Why spend three times the money when I can get all three in one buck? That's that was my right. logic as a kid. Yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and I remember laughing. And then, and then you saying, why the hell is Jack of Hearts on the Avengers? Who the hell is Jack of Hearts? <laughs> why the hell is Triathlon on the Avengers? Yeah. And you're like... Why is it in the superstars, all your biggest characters? Why is it Spider-Man on the Avengers? Why is it Wolverine on the Avengers? And I was like, yeah, why is it? Why aren't they on the Avengers, right? And Bendis was like, yeah, why aren't they on the Avengers? And and Tom Brevoort, and Tom, you know, Tom is arguably one of the greatest editors in the history of comics, without a doubt. And Tom is also this encyclopedic mind of, of, of comics, chapter and verse he recite to you, anything in comics. And Tom got really upset. And <laughs> do you remember this? Remember this? Yeah, and, I do. and I don't think Tom will mind me telling the story out of school. I think I've told it before. Um, and Tom got really upset. He's like, the reason Spider Man and Wolverine are not on the Avengers is because they would never join the Avengers. They're not those kind of characters. Wolverine's a loner. Spider Man's, you know, he they operate alone. They're, and I'm returning to Tom and going, Tom, they're whatever we write them to be. You know, it, mm-hmm. it, 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 you're, you're being too precious about it. And Tom got up and left. He was <laughs> furious at all of us. He just left. <laughs> do you remember this? I do. I stormed <laughs> off. And we were like, okay, what are we going to do? Right? And they were like, okay, Mark. So you're going to write the Avengers. <laughs> and you're like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm like, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm like, Mark is pitching this because he wants to write it. And that's what Brian said. I'll do it. You know? <laughs> but I, I couldn't believe it. You, you, you spent all this time pitching it, and then you wanted no part of it. Now, the kicker to the story is, next day, Tom Brewer came back. Mm-hmm. And, and he, he said, you know what? I lost my cool. I shouldn't have. You guys are right. I fucked up. 
Let's move on. You know I mean, and we did. Yeah. You know, we're all adults in the room. He just, he just had a moment. He had a, he had a, you know, um, you know, we all have these moments in e comics, right? Where we're suddenly yeah. we're eight years old and somebody's fucking with our toys, right? How could you do that? Hey, you lucky devils! Just to let you know, we've got five new comics out this year from Dark Horse Comics. Nemesis Rogues Gallery is out in July. Prodigy Three is out in August. Nightclub Two also out in August. The Magic Order's big finale, Volume 5, is out in September, and the Jupiter's Legacy finale is finally here in October. Also out from Dark Horse this year, we have the Wanted in Big Game hardcover, a huge library edition, and the Ambassadors with all your favourite artists collected into one big beautiful hardcover in November. Don't miss it. I used to uh, love doing that though. That's that's what I loved about the summits. Remember, we'd all be around the table, sort of talking about each other's books. And I remember yeah. Dan Buckley because there's something quite nice about doing not having to do the work, just uh, suggesting something, and then you can step back and let someone else do yeah. the actual work. Right. And I remember Dan Buckley was saying, "I don't know what's going on with Spider-Man. Like, amazing Spider-Man does brilliant business, spectacular does less, and then these other Spider books. There was a third Spider book not doing too good, like Web of or something." And he said, how do we get these up to the levels of amazing? And I said, just call them all Amazing Spider-Man. <laughs> so yeah. I used to lie in, I would just step step back and leave the room, you know, and it, yeah. it kind of works, it pulled the rest of the books up. Yeah, and, and, and we, already had a, we already had a proven test model in Ultimate Spider-Man, right? Yeah. We were, you know, there's a concern, will, will retailers and fans want book twice a month, right? Yeah. If it's really good, um, and, oh, you know, the point I was, I was making earlier about, about Bill and I were, we, we ex as we were creating this stuff and, and putting together these teams, we knew that the stories that were coming out of you guys were, were top notch. So we, we, we felt if we had, if we could get some attention, we'd get some new readers. Mm -hmm. The big surprise to us, uh, to everyone, was that lapsed readers came in. Yes. There were people who had read comics their entire life, were just waiting to hear that there was something good. Absolutely, uh, they didn't die. They they just got bored with what Marvel was doing. Absolutely, yeah, and that happens and, every twenty years, you know. It's, yeah, and and then so, and then when they hear about, it, they're like, "Oh, I'm going to go to yeah. the store. I'm going to see what the hubbub is about." Right? Yeah. Um, if there's no hubbub, then all you're left with are, are characters that mm -hmm. that nobody's doing anything with. Yeah. So, so, anyway, so, so that that was one of my moments. The other one was when we were trying to figure out the um, the lead in. Uh, when, when when Ed was writing the Captain America, the death of Captain America, mm -hmm. right? And we were trying to figure out where do we go from there. I, I forget what the moment was. And we were arguing three different points. And like out of the blue, Joss Whedon steps into the office. Literally, like we conjured Joss Whedon. Mm. And he sat there. He heard the pitch. He's like, oh, it definitely has to be this one. And he walked away. <laughs> Whatever it was. It, was, it, it had to do something with the death of Steve Rogers. I forget what the, what the point it, was. I remember, remember ex exactly what it was. It was, it was the link between Civil War and uh, and the death of Captain America. And Josh came in and sort of it, it had three possible paths or something. And he genuinely appeared out of nowhere. I remember he walked in. It was like that scene in Annie Hall, you know, yeah. where Woody Allen just grabs that guy and has him answer the question like Marshall McClure yeah. you know it was exactly yeah. that scene and then he just left again he came in for like 10 minutes fixed fixed it and then left it was it was right. very impressive there was, there was that another great moment was the Civil War moment uh -huh. right where we had you know we had done several creative summits at this point we were the we were we were cocky we were like you know we are, you know, we're an invincible team. We're, every mm. every one of these summits, we come up with gold, gold, right? Yeah. And they're three days long, and we had two days of absolutely nothing. Mm. The only thing that we had was we we had this um, World War Hulk idea, right? Mm. Which was a good idea, but it's just something about it wasn't. We couldn't figure out exactly what it was at the time that it wasn't clicking. It didn't feel like an event at the time, didn't it? It was right. It, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it just felt like it felt like something we just we just conjured up because mm -hmm. we had to. Mm -hmm. But Mark, we had nothing. We, nothing, you know, I, yeah. I think all of us had a sense of panic. Mm. And then, was it you and Brian in a cab um, on the cab ride to the third day of the summit, which is a bit, which was a much smaller group at that point. I think it was just yeah. there were there were no editors. I think it was just you, Brian Shazinski, Loeb. It was a really small group of us, and. You guys, I think it shared a cab, and 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 you said something to the effect of like civil war, right? And you guys had this sort of uh, 
I don't know exactly. You know, because there was so much stuff going on at that point politically in the U.S., right, between mm -hmm. civil liberties, civil rights, and all that sort of stuff, yeah. um, there was something about it that just suddenly when, when, when you mentioned it and the idea of Tony Stark versus Steve Rogers and each one is taking a position in this argument, right, yeah. by making superpowers illegal – Suddenly, everybody exploded with ideas. It was crazy, right? And Tony Stark became the most desired character for every. I want Tony Stark in my book. I want Tony yeah. Stark here. I want Tony Stark there, right? Because he became so interesting in that in that moment. Um, and just that 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 those last few hours that where, where we not only did we salvage three days, yeah. but we created something. And then you went on to write. Arguably the greatest crossover, you know, in the history of comics, right? Oh, um, Crisis and Infinite Earths would like to have a word with you. Come on, you know. What was that? Crisis and Infinite Earths would like to have a word with you. You know, like I don't know, I'm, I'm below Crisis. I'm, you know? <laughs> I'm so, I, I, crisis was great for what it was, right? It really was, but I still think the Civil War. What made Civil War special, I think, aside from the fact that it was it was a great concept, a great series, um, was the fact that. It was seven issues, right? You, you, you wrote seven. seven. I think it was originally six, but you, you needed seven. Um, you could read those seven issues. We, we, we told fans, you don't have to buy any of the, any of the ancillary books. Oh, right? I never read the tie-ins. I didn't even read them. No, I just read the yeah. <laughs> what I'm saying is we, we told fans, yeah. Yeah. we're doing an event that you don't, you don't have to buy everything. Yeah. It's yeah. not a Red Sky event, right? You could just buy Civil War and you will get the entire story. Mm. But if you want... Some deeper stuff, all these other books. Mm -hmm. Consequently, because the, the core concept for Civil War was so strong, all the ancillary books became 10 times better. Everybody was hitting on all cylinders. And all that stuff sold like crazy. And none of it connected directly to your story. The themes were there, right? But there was no like event that happened in your book that then would be... Yeah. Oh, Shum absolutely, yeah. You know? That was a condition of me writing. I didn't want to cross over with other yeah. people because it's like doing a jigsaw. But the, am I right in thinking that those tie-in books sold like two or three times what they normally did? It was something crazy, wasn't it? There was, everything sold. Everything it was sold. a really weird moment yeah. where it went nuts. It, it, yeah. it excited the industry because yeah. it was a subject matter that it was it was a subject matter that was real to people mm -hmm. without, but it was all dealt in metaphor. All yeah. dealt in metaphor, right? I remember going to panels and saying, you know, who's on team cap? 90% mm. of the, of the audience would like roar cheery. Who's yeah. on team, team Iron Man, Tony Stark? 10% and yeah. a lot of booze. I'm like, okay, but I want to, I want to, I want to put you guys in, I want to put you guys in a real world situation. All right. Imagine we're in this room right now and suddenly you hear the doors of the convention room here of, of this, of this conference room, just slam shut. And there's a bunch of dudes and gals wearing masks, holding AK-47s, standing at the doors and saying, hey, don't worry. We're just here for your protection. Don't worry about who we are. How are you going to feel? Right? Mm -hmm. That's what's actually happening in this story. So yeah. before you go booing Tony Stark... Yeah, maybe think about it from those real, but 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 you know, totally we live right. in the world. But that's that's when that's when what we do is really at its best, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we do the Star Trek thing where we tell stories that are allegories and metaphors for what really, you know, what really touches us, right? If 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 you know, how often did did I talk about heart, heart, heart of the story? What's the heart yeah. of the story? It's not just yeah, we we want to have our heroes punching, but but the punching has to drive the heart of the story. Um, and Civil War is full of it, man. It was full of it from, 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 from the inciting incident all the way to the very, very end of it. Um, and it pitted fans, uh, it gave fans, you know, asked a question, um, whose side are you on? 
And, you know, looking back on that story, it's like, it's super poignant if you look back on it, you know. Well, do you know what's crazy? When I wrote it, I remember at the time thinking, this is going to be out in a day, out of date in a year or two. Like, America's going to go back to being at ease with itself, right? And this was like 2007 or something, you know? Yeah. Like, I thought America was going to heal. I thought this was the George W. Bush era was just a temporary kind of like difficult time, you know? Yeah. And little did I suspect civil war was going to, you know, sell for the next yeah. 20 years, you know? Yeah. So crazy. Yeah. You know, it, it's, look, I, I, I don't think to, to, get, to get a little, a little, uh, a little, not political, but a little social here. I don't think we're any more or less divided than we ever were. I think the difference is that now we hear it all the time. That's true. Social, That's the noise. Media, yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I don't think, you know, how often have, you know, Mark, I don't know. You've been, you ever been to a pub? I, I think, I think you've been to a, a pub or two, I, right? I've never been out of a pub. This is the pub. You know? <laughs> right. So, you know, right. You go to, you go to your local yeah. and there's always that crazy person in mm. the corner. Yeah. Spouting all sorts of crazy ideas, conspiracy ideas, crazy uh, ideologies, whatever it may be. And generally, the majority of the people in the bar who really politically live in the middle, right? Mm. Right? Some lean a little left, some lean a little right, but most people live in the middle. They just go, ah, that's just crazy Bob, right? Let him rant. Mm. Well, now crazy Bob has a YouTube channel. Crazy yeah. Bob... Uh, uh, it, it is a democrat democratization of opinions without actually being able to categorize it, right? So this one voice now sounds like, you know, 10 million. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's part of what is happening right now is, is to me, is the fact that it's, it's, it's always out there. And then you have news networks that bifurcated, right? And took political sides on both, on all sides of the spectrum, right? And only preaching their beliefs. So there, there, there's a, I think there's a, there's a whole world, there's a whole audience of people and, 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 and voters out there who are just looking for moderation. And a lot of cases are also afraid to say anything because, you know, the sides of the extreme will take their heads off. Hmm. Both sides of the extreme. But it's interesting sides. when you put a bunch of people together in any situation, they kind of agree on almost everything as well. People just want to have a roof over their heads, the bellies full, their kids to be okay, a decent education, good health care. Yeah. Everybody kind of agrees that's all they really want. It's, but you're right, it's the fringe nutters that everybody hears, isn't it? Yeah. Look, my, my, my brother-in-law... Um, you know, is on a different side of the political spectrum than I am. Mm -hmm. And I say that lightly because we agree on probably 98% of stuff. Mm. I really do, you know? And when we have our conversations, we're like, oh yeah. And I remember meeting him for the first time and going, oh man, uh, this could be weird. It wasn't weird at all, you mm -hmm. know? We're both logical and, and, and sensible people talking about, you know, because we all have the same needs. We all have the same wants and desires, ultimately. Right. Aside from, you know, uh, you know our careers and stuff like that, you know, we, we, mm -hmm. we all want to be able to uh, support our families, feed our families, uh, make sure our kids are happy and have, have better opportunities that we did. A roof over our head. Uh, these are like basic human needs. We all have these regardless of what our political slant is or who we're voting for. Um, and I feel that when we tell stories, if we address those basic human needs, then everything else that you want to talk about in a story goes down a lot easier, including your political beliefs, if you want to insert them in there, right? But, but, but you know, we, we, we have to start out with the commonality, mm -hmm. um, which, I, which I think sometimes uh, creators forget. You know, it, it certainly it certainly see it happening in Hollywood or saw it happening in Hollywood. Now they're looking and, and going, oh, shit, we, we haven't been making any money <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know? because we forgot. We forgot how to make sitcoms. We forgot how to make procedurals. We yeah. forgot how to make uh, TV for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and consequentially, you know, it, 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 TV and movies have become niche. Uh, and, and, and I'm not talking about genre. I'm just talking about, you know, niche in a lot of ways where it becomes unrelatable to people, right? Um, well, comics has done the same thing, though. Do you think comics has gone to a niche and I think, I think I mean, people put all this weight on comics are like, you know, comics are this, comics have gone that, and they mm -hmm. try to politicize this thing. This is mm -hmm. entertainment as a whole, 
right? Mm-hmm. It's not just. I think it you, isn't. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. You know, you, you think comics are having a hard time? Take a look at Hollywood. Take a look at the austerity measures. How hmm. many? I mean, Mark, thousands of thousands of people have been laid off. This is not the case in comics. Comics are actually mm-hmm. doing pretty good, right? Uh, we have up years, we have down years, uh, we have some flat years, but the entertainment business as a whole has been shooting itself in the foot. The, the the fact that major studios, you know, they 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 had a golden goose mm-hmm. for decades. The golden yeah. goose was called movie theaters, right? Mm. Movie theaters, even when you had a bomb, you still the successes outweighed the bombs, and you 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 know people got very very rich in Hollywood off of movie theaters. Mm. And at some point, people started to look at Netflix and say, oh, they've got it right. They'll slide to Netflix, but they, mm-hmm. they've got it right. And everybody jumped on the streaming model and forced, it just, take, just said to hell with the golden goose. Mm-hmm. There's more money here. And there mm. wasn't. Yeah. And now the golden goose is struggling to stay alive. It would literally be like, like, like the comic book industry saying, you know what, we don't need the direct market. Let's just go into the returnable market. Yeah. Let's just go into the yeah. newsstand business again. Let's go into the bookstore business again. Without that non-returnable market, there'd be no comic industry. That's the truth. Or it'd be a mm. different oh, comic It goes industry. overnight. Yeah, yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So, so, you know, to, 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 to see what, you know, the, the business practices that, that got Hollywood to where it is. And, and, you know, it hurts all entertainment at the end of the day. But I think I think with comics, what happens is that that, you know, I think there are a lot of really, really good comics out there, but you've got a bunch of folks, you know, <laughs> you'll love this comparison, Mark. So, so what, where did you buy your comics when you were, when you were younger, Mark? Uh, just the corner store. Yeah. Corner store. Right. Mm-hmm. Imagine you went to that corner store when you were a kid mm-hmm. and there was somebody's dad, like a dad, a guy dad age telling you, don't buy that shit. That's written by so-and-so. Oh, that book sucks. You go, Whoa. Right. That's what we have today. We have dads on YouTube telling people, you know, how much comics suck because they aren't the comics that they remember when they were eight years old, right? These guys, it's like a death cult. It literally is a death cult. I don't know, you know, because I, I think personally, you know, I remember in the 90s thinking, why am I buying hardly any comics? You know, I've been down to buying about four titles in the 90s yeah. uh, from buying maybe 20 or something before. And then your area of Marvel, you know, and like... Uh, even a, f- a few DC books were pretty good towards the end of that decade and everything. You know, I was suddenly I was buying about twenty books again, and now I'm buying like two or three, and they're all indies. You know, like I, I think my my own personal comic buying and my friends that they've kind of dropped out of the market. You know, so I think we're just in one of those periodic things where there's a bunch yeah. of guys our age working in comics, and there needs to be a new wave. You know, the, when, the way we came in in the year two thousand, the way the nineteen eighty guys came in, the nineteen sixty guys came in. I think there's an exciting wave, you know, and you can see some of them coming through already, you know. The Energon books are fantastic, Transformers, G.I. Joe, all that stuff. I love what they're doing with Ultimate Spider-Man. Guys like Jeremy Slater coming through, you know. So I don't know. I think we've turned a corner. I think there's a lot of good stuff just coming up now, but we need a ton more of it. I, I was talking to to um, an executive friend, mm-hmm. you know, in the comics industry. And... And admittedly, you know, sales are not bad. Sales are actually pretty healthy. Um, but the growth period that you saw during COVID, right, clearly mm-hmm. during COVID, yeah. is not the same as the same chart that we're looking at, the, that we're looking at today. But it's still very, very healthy. But he did say, he's like, yeah, you know, there's a malaise. It feels like there's a bit of a creative malaise. And... Um, I can't say I can, argue, I can argue with that, but I also can't say I, 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 I agree with it because I just, I haven't been reading a lot of stuff. But that's what I mean, you know, like, remember there would always be like four books that you say, Frank Miller's doing this or Grant Morrison's doing that, whatever. There was always somebody doing something yeah. cool. I have less of an interest in doing superheroes or reading superheroes yeah. now than I have because it's... It, 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 was, it was actually part and parcel, you know, there, there was something that Bendis said to me when I was sort of on the fence of like, you know, I feel like my time at Marvel, is, I think, I feel like it's, it's coming up. Right. Mm-hmm. And Brian said, you know, I, my, 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 my daughter was just about to get out of college and with all these sort of life changing things. And, and, and I started thinking back on my, you know, creator own days and thinking, you know, when, when, you know, the day that I'm, you know, dead and buried and trust me, I'm like a hamburger away. 
at any point. Mm. Um, what, you know, what am I leaving? What am I leaving her? Right. Mm. Outside of a legacy of Marvel, which is mm. really not worth anything to her. Right. Mm. What am I leaving in terms of characters, in terms of like, what have I done outside of this place? I mean, she mm. loves Marvel. She loved my time. Marvel, but what am I doing outside of that? And I really started to question that. And it was Brian who said to me, dude, what do you have left to do up there? What's mm -hmm. left for you to do? Mm -hmm. You've done comics, animation, television, movies, video games, theme parks, uh, music, like Broadway shows, the whole thing, yeah. uh, um, stage shows, arena shows. I've been involved in all that stuff. It's like, what, mm -hmm. what's there left for you to do? And literally, it was like a hammer to the head. I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was at that point that I started saying, you know, clock's got to start ticking. Yeah. But yeah. once... Once I, I sort of clocked out, you know, Marvel, mm -hmm. I knew that the last thing I wanted to do was like, like write or draw superheroes, like the stuff yes. that I'm, I wanted to do stuff that was more personal. So no slight to the folks that are doing superheroes now, but I'm just like, mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, I keep hearing about like, uh, you know, I hear Moon Knight's really, really good, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll get to it. I just, it's just, it's just something that I'm, I'm, I'm personally interested in, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just like, I'm, I'm not watching rom-coms either right um and maybe i'll get my taste for superheroes back again but i always love genre genre i love right of any 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 form so but i think i think that that there is a new wave coming of creators that are that are going to excite people and get the ball rolling in a whole different direction the industry is going to be in a different place than it that it that it's been in the last 20 years you know from yeah distribution well, model. Be, i mean i mean there's the there's the super cycles as well you know you've got the 40 year newsstand cycle followed by the 40 year direct market cycle something something yeah. new is definitely coming and amongst those 20 year cycles as well you know yeah. so I, def I feel i feel there's something brewing and people are trying new things which i think is really exciting as well so yeah. like People are trying new models, trying direct-to-consumer models and so on, you know. Uh, try digital. Something will come through. It's a bit like, you know, in evolution, where a whole bunch of things try to be the next thing and then something succeeds and becomes the next right. thing. It feels but, but like that, about, which I'm really excited about as a reader. Yeah. You know? The thing about cycles that's interesting, though, is, right, like, like if you look at the, if, at the technology cycle, right, mm -hmm. technology cycle, you know, it would be every certain number of decades, something new mm -hmm. would come back around and reinvent the world. But that cycle starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So I'm wondering what's happening in comics, if that window is going to get smaller and smaller before we change, right? Because mm -hmm. look, the, the, the next big thing may not be for Marvel and DC. It may be something mm -hmm. completely unexpected. It generally is, right? Um, because we creators, it, uh, I'll tell you another my, one of my pet peeves, and this will probably, I'll re eventually write this in a newsletter, but I hate when people use this quote and misquote, which is, don't give the audience what they want, give the mm -hmm. audience what they need. I fucking hate that, Mark. You know why? <laughs> because it is the ultimate in arrogance. It's like, snobby, yeah. I know yeah. what you need, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. Imagine going up yeah. to, a, to a customer in the shop saying, I've written something that you need. You need mm -hmm. this. You don't want it. Mm -hmm. You need it, right? Yeah. The actual quote from Stan's point of view was, mm -hmm. don't give the audience what they want. Give them what they really want. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a whole different thing. And yeah. The thing about what they really want is that we don't know what the yeah. audience really, really yeah. wants. Yeah. Until, just like they don't know, until they get it. Yeah. Um, so... It's hard, you know, I, I can't sit here and say, well, you know, there'll be another superhero boom or who knows the, you know, it, 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 it can be a completely different genre. It could be a completely different delivery system. Mm -hmm. um, but comics, you know, the, the, the good news is comics are not dying despite the doom and gloom that's been out there year in, year out, that is now just amplified by YouTube and, and, and. Uh, all these ridiculous negative bloggers who just like, you know, want to shit all over the industry. But uh, I think it feels like the end of the seventies, the end of the nineties, and and now you know it feels those are those periods where there's a, a downturn, you know, and it's just before something comes in. You know, like in music, it happens as well. You know, yeah. just before the next big thing. Like music normally has a big new wave every eleven years. You know, from yeah. the fifties, sixties, seventies, and so on. And it's a little tedious for a couple of years before the new thing comes in. You know, I think it feels like that in comics just now. Like basically, 
Guys, guys in their twenties and their tw- late twenties, early thirties, you know, need to come in and blow everyone away. I think, and that's what I'm excited about. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I think another thing that's happening that makes this this a very interesting era, especially for superheroes, is that you know, you often, how often do you hear uh, a fan say, "Geez, it's just like the same." You know, they've done this story with Batman before. They've done this story mm-hmm. with Spider Man before. You know. Can't they, can't they just come with something new, right? Mm-hmm. But this is coming from like a 50 or 60 year old fan. Yeah. I've been yeah. reading them. That's true. Yeah. Myself. We used to be a three year fan. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like when you read any genre, I don't care if it's Western, I don't care whatever it may be. Yeah. If you read it for that long a period of time with the same continuous characters over time, mm-hmm. eventually there's going to be a cycle where it repeats itself. Yeah. And suddenly you realize, you're getting angry, but the truth of the matter is that it's no longer for you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and every once in a while, there'll be somebody that something that'll peek out and it'll be like really, really different, right? Th- th- this is what made Dark Knight and Watchmen so special at the time was that they did something that nobody dared do, which was deconstruct mm-hmm. superheroes, mm-hmm. deconstruct them in, in a way that you've never seen, like you know, characters that didn't kill were killing characters that. that um, but now we've gone. We've gone to the edge. So what? Mm-hmm. Where, where do we go? Do we do we jump off? Do we come back? There, there's so many different things. So, um, you know, we, I, I keep waiting for rock and roll to come back. <laughs> Remember rock and roll? Remember rock and roll was everything, right? And did, did you ever? Uh, did you ever have Stan as a sounding board? You know, just when you mentioned Stan, there, I, I'd never considered this before. But so few people have sat in that chair that you mm-hmm. sat in. Did you ever call them up, like, and just chat and talk about your day and uh, get advice? You ever heard so my greatest my 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 cold calling Stan Lee story? No, I've never heard that. No, I've done story a million yeah. times. Um, this 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 was this was a game changer for me. Mm. Um, you know, I had met Stan at a convention here and there, shook his hand and stuff. But you know, I was just like you know, lowly freelancer and just happy to meet my idol, right? And mm. and um, and Stan was one of the few people that just, just did not disappoint, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you're always afraid to meet your heroes, but Stanley was exactly, exactly who I wanted him to be, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. In my mind's eye, I imagined him being this guy, and that's exactly who he was. And he met me for the first time, and he puts his hand on my shoulder. Hey, Joey, so glad to meet you. You know, keep up the great work. He hadn't seen my work, but didn't matter, <laughs> right? It did, but but that, that was the beauty of him. That was his yeah. beauty power. So we're starting Marvel Knights. And I get all the pitches in, all four books. I get the pitches. And, dude, Jimmy and I, we don't know what the fuck we're doing, right? We're, we're like, we, we, we kind of we knew we were doing, but, but suddenly being within the Marvel offices and actually, wow, we get to do this from scratch. We get to edit these books from scratch and create them from scratch. It was pretty daunting. We're like, ah, are we doing it right? Yeah. So I cold called Stan. Right. And introduced myself, and he was lovely on the phone. I said, Stan, you know, we're doing this thing called Marvel Knights, and like, you know, he didn't quite grasp all of it, right? Because to him, it's all Marvel. But so he just thought it was just like, you know, sort of an imprint within the company kind of thing, just a line of books. So um, I said, Stan, if I sent you these pitches, would, would you read them and just give me some notes? He's like, absolutely, Joey. And I'm like, holy shit, this is great. I, I said, stand the pitch, the pitches. And, you know, 24 hours later, Stan is on the phone with me, you know, talking to me about, you know, uh, about the stories and, 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 and the DNAs of the characters. And I mean, he didn't put it in that, in that fashion, mm-hmm. but basically what made the characters, the characters. And, you know, I walked away with it with a head swimming with knowledge that I didn't know it, how much of it I'd forgotten. But, at the end of the call, as we're, you know, you know, you, you sense when the conversation is coming to an end, right? Mm-hmm. I said, Stan, just, just one more question. And Mark, I was being facetious as fuck. <laughs> I said, Stan, is there a formula for the perfect Marvel character? Right? I'm like, listening. He's like, let me tell you the formula, Joey. And Mark, I literally <laughs> took the phone and like, <laughs> like he has a fucking formula. <laughs> and I'm listening to this. And he's like, he said, so Joey, imagine, imagine Spider-Man. He's standing at the precipice of a building. The concrete jungle that is New York lies before him. 
It's raining. And then he, he extends his hand out and flips a ribbon of webbing that attaches to a building far off in the distance. And I'll get up for Stanley thing again. And he <laughs> swings off into the night. It's like, pretty good scene, right, Joey? And I'm like, that's a great scene, Stan. He's like, no, it's not. I'm, okay. <laughs> He's like, no. He's like, tell me who's inside that suit. Who does he love? Who loves him? What are his hopes and desires? What are his fears? What does he aspire to do? Why does he do what he does? Why does he put himself in danger? Now, when he jumps off that precipice of the building, our hearts clutch because we're inside there with him. That's amazing. And That's so simple on. and so brilliant. This, was the, this is the line. Yeah. If not, it's just a red and blue suit. Wow, I love that. I that love was that. it. That, so that was, so from that point on, I knew every great Iron Man story yeah. was really a great Tony Stark story. Yes. It had to be a great Tony Stark story. Fuck the armor. Once you put the armor on, now it becomes ultimately cooler. Every great, think about all the greatest comic book stories you could remember. They're about Peter Parker first. They're about Tony Stark, Steve Rogers. They're about the, the, they're about the character inside the costume because that's the paradigm shift that Stan and, and Steve and John and Jack and all those guys, that's the paradigm shift that happened in the 60s. Whereas you might have heard me give this spiel before, and I don't say this in a derogatory manner, but the Marvel characters were inherently more honest than the DC characters. And again, don't take that as a negative statement. What I mean by that is when Clark, when little Cal L crash lands on planet Earth and, you know, is, is you know, rescued from the capsule and he grows up amongst us. He adopts the persona of Clark Kent, right? And then he becomes Superman. But the real person, the real person is Cal L. Superman. He becomes Clark Kent in order to live. It's a facade he puts on in yeah. order to live amongst us, right? Clark Kent's the costume. But Clark Kent's the costume. Yeah. Superman is the real person. Mm. Young Bruce Wayne walks out of a movie theater, sees his parents killed in front of him. From that moment on, Bruce Wayne dies and becomes Batman. And Bruce Wayne becomes a vehicle that he uses in order to facilitate Batman. Batman's the real character. Bruce Wayne is the foppish facade, right? Totally. It's like Zorro, isn't it? You know, like it's the, you know, he's the, uh, you know, what he does by day, what Batman's yeah. doing during the day, essentially, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so Batman's real character, Superman's real character. Their alter egos are the masks. Hmm. What Stan did was the opposite. He made the mask the alter ego. And he made the characters the true person, right? So Peter Parker is a shy, nebbishy kind of kid, but when he puts on that mask, he's a joker, he's a, you know, he's he's wise and he, he does all these great things, but take off that mask, he's just a lovable loser like the rest of us. And that's an infinitely much more relatable paradigm because, you know, when, when, when you have a meeting at Netflix, right? You've got your Mark, hey, I'm the creator of businessman mask on. Mm. Then you come home to your, to your kids and you got your daddy mask on, right? I don't know, business dad, hand. business dad to the kids. <laughs> they call me Mr. Mella, you know, yeah. We, we all wear masks all day long, right? Yeah. So that, that shift in the paradigm was, was what made Mac Marvel's characters not only magical, but also, if you notice, they, they grow, they age better through time. Right. Mm -hmm. The, mm -hmm. you know, the, the reason Ultimate Spider-Man worked was because Brian figured out a way to still make Peter Parker, Peter Parker, but change him just enough to mm -hmm. modernize him for today's kids. Um, every time DC tries to marvelize their characters and tries to do that, they fail because because their characters aren't designed that way. You know, I, I often yeah. said that if I had been running DC, you don't you don't follow the Marvel formula. Do yeah. what DC does. Go that route. You're totally that right. Route. You know, it's a square peg in a round hole, isn't it? You're absolutely yeah. right. You, you can't yeah. you, because the characters aren't designed that way. They're not. That's not who they are. Um, just like if if you know, every every time Marvel tries to make their characters way too godlike, way too powerful, um, nobody cares. 
because mm-hmm. it, it's 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 about the person. It's a little more grounded. So that was the advice that Stanley gave me. That to this day, I use not just with Marvel, with anything I do. Right. Start with the alter ego. Start with you know. One of the greatest superhero movies of all time before there were superheroes was Die Hard, mm. right? All you need to do is put, put you know, became into a superhero costume and, you know, it's a superhero movie. But that movie had all the heart in the world, right? But he's a Marvel hero. He's not a DC hero. Yeah. He's a Marvel hero. Absolutely yeah. Marvel hero, yeah. right? Because it's um, funny, like, uh, I always think this is why I'm a DC guy as well, you know, as a reader, yeah. as a kid. But I think that's why DC struggles cinematically because cinema relies so much on character, whereas the DC characters are based around costumes and powers, essentially, aren't they? And when they try and shoehorn a personality into Barry Allen or Hal Jordan or whatever, yeah. It doesn't quite work, you know, because it, it wasn't there at the beginning, you know. And yeah. it could be good comics and everything, but the Marvel guys, it didn't really begin until 1961, that, mm-hmm. that idea of doing superheroes like that. Yeah, and look, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why the first Superman movies were so wonderful, right? Yeah. And so much of it had to do with Chris Reeves because you, you've seen those clips where they, where, they, where they isolate him playing Clark Kent versus playing mm-hmm. Superman. Right. Mm. And there's that moment where, you know, when, when nobody's paying attention and he's Clark Kent and he's just sort of standing around barrel chested. And then, you know, I think Lois walks into the room and suddenly he's just doing this. Right. Mm. Mm. He's automatically putting on the facade. Mm. He's playing the character the way it's meant to be played. Right. Um, and you'd have to assume that with Clark Kent, there is a level of like, shit, I can't be my true self. Right. Mm. I, like, like, you know, and, and when he's done well. Right. It's like. Lois doesn't know who I am. She yeah. really doesn't know who I am. I really want to tell her. That's the drama. That's the grist yeah. in Clark Kent. Um, as opposed to Peter Parker's grist is like, God, if, 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 if you know, I, I, can't, I can't ask this girl out. If only she knew I was Spider-Man, then she'd think I was cool. Right? Did, did, did the Marvel movie guys utilize Stan? Here's a question I've always wanted to ask somebody, and you're the guy that'll know the answer. Stan was always executive producer, but you know, sometimes that can just mean you created it. You know, you're not in the meetings, you're at the premiere right. and, and you created it. Was Stan utilized? Like, was he actually used by the Marvel Studios guys? Did he come in and look at the scripts and give notes and did they listen to those notes? I, I honestly don't know. I, I would I would venture to say probably not. Right. I think he was he was there he was really there spiritually. And I think, you know, yeah. he was there along the way to say, Hey Stan, check this out check out what we're doing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he would actually have been, you know, he certainly wasn't in any of the meetings that I was at, you know, right, right then. Um, but then he wasn't doing the stuff with us in the comics either. Right? Yes, that's true. Um, yeah, he was a figurehead. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, kicker to that Stan Lee story, that cold calling Stan Lee story. Yeah. Marvel was so pissed at me, so pissed at me for cold calling him yeah. because, you know, Stan was on a salary with Marvel. Mm-hmm. You know, he was on a, on a, on a stipend. Um, and, and I, I don't know if that meant that they had him available for only for certain hours a month. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what it was. Yeah. Yeah. I, my cold calling him <laughs> infringed upon something. And we got in a lot of trouble for that. And I was like, ah, fuck it. You know, it won't be the first yeah. and the last time I get into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, so I got to close this blind here because I'm, I'm no problem. literally drowning in sunlight. And I think I it's good. Another thing that, I mean, just to start closing up, you know, but. Another thing that um, I think people aren't aware of is just how important you were in the whole Marvel Studios thing, you know? Like, I mean, obviously you, you reinvented Marvel Comics, but you were so instrumental in every page of every movie, pretty much, weren't you? You know, like you were out at every one of those meetings as those films were being made. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, I can't say I was at every single meeting, but, the, you know, we had the creative committee. No, so for each movie, though, I mean, you were, you were, you were there for each one? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, look, I mean, it... It's a whole, it takes a village thing, man. None of this stuff happens in a, in a vacuum, right? right? And, and you know, the, you know, I, I, I remember seeing this and, and, and you know, you, you take, you take your lessons where you could, where you could take them. Um, you know, I was around at Marvel when I saw lots of people get laid off. I was around at Marvel where, when I saw people leave Marvel because they're like, you know, hey, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, such a hot shot that I'm going to take, I'm going to take this heat and I'm going to, you know, do my own thing. Right. Not realizing that there's one important thing. Any of us who've been successful at Marvel, we have one very important thing in common. We are all creative trust fund babies. Hmm. All of us, you, Mark, me, we were all handed at one point, this vault 
of gold ingots hmm. called Spider-Man, Captain America. And it was up to us to reinvest and, 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 you know, do well with it or, you know, grind it into the ground. Uh, I think we did okay. I think, I think as a group, we left the characters, not just, you know, the job is to make sure you do no harm. Right. But, but we actually left them in a better place than they ever were. Um, so, you know, the, the, the beauty of the team at Marvel, Marvel studios, Marvel television, you name it, is that as long as I keep referring to we, even though I'm not at Marvel anymore, but I, I'll, I'll get to as long as we remember who these characters are and the DNA and we, and, and we, we, uh, remember the value of that, of what these characters are and, and how they've been constructed, right? The, because if not, it's just a red and blue suit, right? Um, success will follow. And I think whenever you've seen periods at Marvel where success is not followed, mm-hmm. it's because they've forgotten that mission statement. They've forgotten about the alter ego. And, and, and really, the most successful Marvel characters, what makes their alter ego, what makes them successful is that their alter ego has it has an element of relatability where, look, I, I can't relate to a billionaire, Tony Stark. You could, uh, but I can't. <laughs> uh, but there's something about Tony Stark and and his personality and his makeup that it's not about the money. It's not about any, it's just about the character himself, right? Uh, that makes him infinitely relatable and interesting. Bruce Banner, you know, Peter Parker, all these characters uh, have that thing. If we forget that, then, you know, we could look around and, well, we shouldn't be surprised that something isn't successful, whether it's a comic book, a TV show, or a movie. There's only two uh, parts of Tony Stark I can't relate to, and it's, but it's, it's the philanthropist part. You'd be right. giving the money away, you know, I could only hang on to the cash. I could, I you know, could never you give know, it to Mark, the you, You're so full of shit. I see <laughs> you. You are so philanthropic. You, you know, you, you do so much for your community. Um, and... Uh, you know, I know your community is really grateful for it, but you are philanthropic, you know. And That's I, just me I, buying I, people drinks. That's all that is, you know. So. <laughs> I love that about you. You know what I mean? And and, and the thing is that 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 you're not out there. Uh, you might post a little something here and there, but you're not out there. Look at me boasting about it. You know what I mean? Um, I'm know, actually kind of embarrassed when I do it, though, because... What, the only reason I even mention it ever online is that nobody comes to the events unless I mention them because it's a weird kind of central figure that they all follow on Twitter or Facebook, or whatever, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I try and do stuff behind the scenes because it is kind of weird, isn't it, doing it publicly, you know? But, but the thing is, the thing is cool. that you know, when I see people do things like th- that philanthropically and, and 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 use it as a as a marketing tool, yeah, right. Oh yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. It's it's come on, really. Yeah, you, you're you're. The, 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 this is not out of the goodness of your heart, right? Yeah. True philanthropy, t- true generosity. That's in that sense, you just do it. You just yeah. do it because it's yeah. the right thing to do. Or it's a, and by the way, not everybody feels that way. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but I, but but I know you know that you do a ton of stuff, and you know um, even though giving millions away is only a minuscule portion of your. <laughs> billions, uh, <laughs> And, and I gotta tell you, I, you know, you and I, I'm gonna, kiss, I'm gonna kiss your ass a little bit longer too. Okay. You remember, you and this I had about put in the trailer. This is about putting the trailer. <laughs> you and I had these conversations many, many times, late at yeah. night, early in the morning, where we would talk about the best way to do things in comics, right? And mm-hmm. and we both agreed, you do you do the work for hire stuff with big characters, mm-hmm. and then you go off and you do your creator own thing, yeah, right? And you use one to leverage the other. Mm-hmm. And 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 in Marvel, if you remember when 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 you wanted to do uh, you know uh, Kick Ass, which with which we set you up with Johnny, right? Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. we felt that Johnny had been a work for hire guy for so long. Yeah, and you love Johnny's art to begin with, but, oh, but you know, we basically teamed you guys up and said, take Johnny, let him do, let him own something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because it's it's it, I think it's good for the soul. And and it's 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 a great methodology, right? And 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 I'm so proud of you, man. I know, you know, we're contemporaries. So me saying I'm proud of you is kind of, is kind of trite. But I really am proud of you as a brother because I love you, at just the way you parlayed your success, the way you played it correctly, right? Again, we've talked about this before. You know, you you had some initial creator own characters that you probably, you probably gave away 
more than you wanted to in terms of, you know, ownership rights, whatever it may be. Oh, but you knew. Mean, no, we had okay. a, we had, I think the first one wanted, we gave away like 40% or something in yeah. return for paid rates for everybody. But everything after that, we owned 100%. We were actually, right. it was okay. But what I'm saying, but I'm saying is, so the, the, you, you, you saw certain things, it's like, okay, this might be a sacrificial lamb that leads to the next big thing mm. and then to the mm -hmm. next big thing. And it did, right? It, it, it landed it landed a great deal at Netflix. Um, and it wouldn't surprise you, it surprised me somewhere down the road, you're like, you know what? I may need to do a little superhero thing here and there or something, you know, uh, before I do the next. But, you know, I, I don't know how long your contract is at, at Netflix or what, well, what your plans are. Fun, it's funny you say that, actually, because I've taken a 12-week carve out. I, uh, I set it up about six months ago because I just thought yeah. it's kind of fun to try something different, you know, and there's muscles that I haven't used for a while, sure. whether it's Marvel, whether it's DC. I had this idea for a, a big Superman story that I absolutely love, but then I had a, an idea, a huge idea for a Marvel project too. So I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be the Marvel one. Uh, I'm leading that way actually at the moment. You know what it's like? Yeah. I mean, CB and all the guys are just a brilliant bunch of people. Yeah. They're really, really nice. And if you're not working with people, you don't have that daily communication with them that you always have. So maybe my 12 weeks out, I do a Marvel thing or something. Yeah. Because it'd awesome. be fun. I couldn't, I think I'm too old now to do it like kind of full time, you know, like you ha I think you have to be in your 30s to do that monthly grind and everything, you yeah. know. But I think that um, it'd be fun for 12 weeks, you know. But I mean, that, funnily enough, this leads into my next question for you, that one of the last two is... By the way, Mark, the, the best thing for you is <sighs> bidding war. <laughs> do, do you know but, but you know you're obviously one of the greatest artists of your, your generation yeah but there's been this weird thing that's happened and you've been a victim of your own success in a way as well like Joe Quesada the artist I miss from having had an amazing experience with Joe Quesada the editor-in-chief you know yeah. and I know that you, you you love drawing but you also at the same time you're super creative in a million other ways like do you ever imagine, is there some fantasy football version of this where there's projects you did over the years, you know, like a Batman project or something, is there writers you wanted to work with, characters you wanted to work on? Because the editor-in-chief thing probably came, was a bit of a curveball, wasn't it? That was probably not your plan in 1996 to, yeah, to be editor-in-chief of Marvel, you know? I, I, used to, I used to compare it to a f to phantom limb syndrome, yeah. you know? Right. Like, like people that, that lose an arm, they <laughs> I feel it's there. So um, I don't have... By the way, so 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 I think today is day one fifty five of my uh, internet colonic. I have hmm. been I've been offline for one hundred fifty five oh. days. Even uh, pornography, pornography too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's been the hardest part. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean literally in one hundred fifty five days. I mean I, yeah. I I I haven't written my newsletter. I only posted twice because I had friends that needed something you know, promoted. Am I okay? Fine. Um, but I've been mean, sort of, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm going through this cleanse, I've, I've done this once before. I did it for, for, for six weeks back in 2017. And it was the greatest thing I ever did. Um, uh, is first of all, the internet's a waste of fucking time. It really mm -hmm. is. You know, uh, if people think that you're actually promoting and selling your books through the internet. You're, you're, you're kidding yourself. Mm -hmm. Really? You are, um, you can promote, but don't expect, you know, the, you're, you, you know, out of my, I don't know, what I have a Twitter, hundred something thousand followers, you know, uh, I'd be surprised if a tenth of them are actual readers. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, so I've taken this sort of, you know, this time off because I'm drawing, I'm writing and I'm drawing. I'm actually doing two projects at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I cannot wait for them to come out because, uh, you know, I'm just, I've taken just everything that I've learned over these years and just putting it down on paper again, you know, and I, I do miss drawing. I miss, I miss it tremendously. Um, but in terms of characters that I've wanted to do, you know, I'm doing something now with the character characters that I wanted to do for a while. But when I'm done with this, I really can't think of any characters that I'd like to do writers. Yeah. Let's do something. You and me. Oh my God. We've uh, we never, yeah. we never, not even a short story. No, no, no. In fact, you've worked with everybody apart from me. You've worked with Garth, Brian, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like Have you done guys. Jeff Loeb and GMS? Have you done them as well? I don't think I've worked with Jeff. All right, that makes me feel slightly better. Yeah, Joe, we, Joe and I have worked together. Uh, Jeff and I have not. Yeah. Uh, but you and I are due. We really oh, yeah. are. We should, we should do something huge. You know, you know something huge. Uh, 
when we start recording, I'll talk to you about something. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, but right now, the two things you're drawing, is it brand new ideas? Is it characters we know already? What, what? Uh, one, one is characters you know. The okay. other one is something, something, it's actually something old, but it's something new, mm-hmm. brand new. Um, and it's really where, it, it's, it's kind of where my heart is at, which is, mm-hmm. you know, these years at Marvel, uh, you know, I kept a little notebook of ideas, right? There, there's certain ideas that, look, Marvel, Marvel hired me for ideas. So I never held back. But mm-hmm. there's certain things that I had ideas for. I'm like, well, that's nothing Marvel would ever publish, right? Mm-hmm. It's a, it, well, th- this is kind of like a, a YA kids book, right? Kids in, in, in junior high school. Marvel would never publish that. No yeah. superpowers, yeah. right? So I keep those ideas to myself uh, mm-hmm. because someday I might want to do them. I don't think I'll be able to get to every single one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, now that, now that, that the shackles are, I shouldn't call them shackles. They were never shackles. <laughs> those, those are, are really shackles. Right. My, my time at Marvel. I love those guys. I love the guys at Disney. I had a great time. I can never complain. Uh, it gave me experiences I never would have had. More importantly, my daughter experienced things that she never would have had if not for my time, you know, at the company. Uh, and more importantly, the friends that I made, uh, re- regardless of how I feel about you. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like, it's like yeah. you and I, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of friendships where you and I cannot, we, maybe we don't speak for the next five years, but when we do, it's as if we, you know, haven't missed a beat. Right. I'll also uh, say to you, why did you not call me for the last five years? What the hell is going on? Where the fuck have you been? Man? Five years. Shit. You know? Holy mackerel. Uh, no, it's but, true though, because it's like being in Vietnam together or something, isn't it? You, you had this massive, this massive life experience together that yeah. we'll never forget. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. So we, we'll always have great memories, you know? It's, yeah. And I always remember like moments in the room, like, like, you know, like Jeff was always great to rue because because Jeff just didn't give a shit sometimes, right? Yeah. And he's like, Mark, Mark, ah, that's a great story. Who punches who? Who the fuck punches <laughs> yes. who? Right? And you and you start taking those things and you're like, everyone's like, you know, I'll be I'll be writing a story and I'm like, I'll hear Jeff's voice, like, who punches who? And I'm like, oh yeah, man, it's just, it's just a lot of people talking. Nobody's punching anybody. Yeah. You gotta get some punching in here, right? Metaphorically, <laughs> physically, however it may be. Um, but we all took those lessons for that time, and I think mm. I think it made it made uh, everybody a better creator. And, and look, you know, after everybody's tenure at Marvel, they ended up in just really great places. Everybody's really doing well. Um, you know, nobody developed that, that, you know, heroin or cocaine addiction that we predicted, you know, some might, you know, uh, Give it time. You, know, uh, you know, so except for Bendis, I know Bendis, yeah, Bendis you know, yeah. <laughs> having that vein, man, sometimes, uh, <laughs> Bendis hang out with us and not drink. Remember, Bendis didn't drink. And he was always great on a night out and everything. It, was, it took me about three years to notice he was standing with a soda the whole time. Yeah. But here's the thing. People think that I'm a drinker. And I, I am a cat. At Mark, we would go to a bar. No one notices. We would go to a bar yeah. and I would order a beer and I would nurse that beer the entire night. Have you ever seen me drunk? I've never. That's like Bruce Wayne. You know the way Bruce Wayne pretends he's having a drink? Yeah, that's basically... That's Have you, you ever seen me drunk? I have no idea. No idea. You've never seen me drunk? Never. Because I, I think you're always drunk. You always seem drunk. I've never seen you sober. As far as yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, it, I've always been really cognizant of it. Like, like there yeah. was, you know, once I started working at Marvel, I developed yeah. this habit. Like, because I, I would always nurse the beer, right? Because yeah. you know, people feel more comfortable, and you know, all right, fine, I'm just hanging out drinking. I'll sip it. Um, but I come from a long line of alcoholics, so you know, it's always been a thing. It's sort but, of I, but you know, like uh, <laughs> it's never stopped, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're you're proud you're proud of the lineage. You got to keep it going, right? Uh, <laughs> That's like a coat of arms, <laughs> right? <It's> a, <laughs> you know, we're the Millers are known for generations. Uh, so, but you know, I, I became very very cognizant that if I was at a bar somewhere or a social function and I had a yeah. beer or a drink in my hands and somebody wanted to take a photo, you would always see me do this. You know, always be behind. Right, interesting. Because I just, the, the last thing I wanted was like photos out there of like, ah, oh, look at the editor-in-chief of Marvel. You know, he's just, yeah. now, but but again, people, because because Jimmy and I, people thought Jimmy and I owned a bar because we 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 were very good friends with the, with the owners and we threw a lot of parties. And because I actually owned a bar once, 
Yeah. Uh, I think people think I'm a, I'm a drinker and I'm really, really not a drinker. As a matter of fact, I'm allergic to a certain kind of alcohol. I'm, uh, I'm so embarrassed how many times, I mean, you were with Garth Ennis and I at like 5 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. You must have just been like, who are these two idiots? You know, like, uh, I know. <laughs> I, the thing is that I love bars because yeah. my, my father, you know, my father's a bartender. He did a lot of things, but I grew up in bars. I grew up in bars since I was like five years old. Um, you know, I, I, I remember all the bar flies and hanging out in Jackson Heights at Pat, Patty's Bar on Roosevelt Avenue. And uh, so I love a bar atmosphere and I love hanging out in bars. Um, I just don't like the effects of a booze that much wow. on me. But yeah, yeah so, so people have this, it always thought that, you know, uh, that I was a heavy drinker, heavy partier. But, yeah. you know, I'm just constantly high, man. I'm You've gone high. down so much in my estimation. <laughs> But you know, uh, one last question, because I actually genuinely don't know this, because um, we, we've never talked about it. Your new job at Amazon, like this, this gig. Oh, you, I'm sorry, what? Your gig at Amazon, like what's the, what's the deal with uh, with this? Oh, I, just, I have a first look deal at Amazon. So, so, so you, what, sorry? I have a first look deal at a Amazon. A first look deal, right, right. Because I heard something, though, that you, you sort of were bringing in other sort of like... Uh, comic book creators and so on you were out looking as a producer really you know out looking for the next new hot indie book kind of thing to bring into oh. amazon or whatever you know as somebody said that to me. part of my job is to you know is to bring things to them they might not be aware of you know right as well right. as my own stuff that i'm creating sure so um so yeah so I, i've done that on occasion i brought some things up for, to them uh, that I thought were really, really interesting. You know, yeah. um, how those meetings go, you know, I really, it's not for me to divulge, but, sure, yeah, uh, yeah. but you know, when, when you have the first, first look deal, that's kind of, it's, you know, it, it's, it's my own projects and anything else that I might find really interesting that, that, you know, I'd love to be a producer on this. You know, this is a really you, you good You seem work. such a natural producer. I mean, you've, you've got the experience in Hollywood through Marvel, but you're also your personality type. You're very good at putting people together, you know, like good teams yeah. together and then energizing them. Is it something you fancy, fancy doing? Yeah, I, I, th I think, I think it just comes from my, you know, my sports background. I, I, I love team experiences. I love collaboration. I think so much more comes out of it, especially mm -hmm. if you find the right team, right? What, one of yeah. the things I was talking to somebody about this recently, right? When, you know, I've, I worked on a number of different creative teams, a number of different creative environments. Um, and the one thing I've learned over time is, uh, for lack of a better word, identifying the asshole in the room, right? Mm -hmm. You you know this, like, like, and it's probably not the right way, the proper way to say it. Yeah. But there's always, not always, but sometimes there's someone in the room, collaborative mm -hmm. room, that... Not that they're better or worse, but they're just not right for the mix, right? And you know it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And as a as sort of a young younger person who is organizing these rooms, I would think, you know what? It'll smoothen out and it'll all work out. And it doesn't. It always gets worse. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I've learned over time is that when you spot, and you, you know, I may be the asshole in the room for all I know, right? Mm -hmm. But when you when you spot that person, the merciful thing to do is to get them out of that situation because it's bad for the room and it's also not good for their career and things like that. So um, I have done a lot of that. I've learned a lot from that. Right. About, about you know, balancing the room with just the right creative people. Right. Like, you, you, you know, this. I mean, we, you know, you can very easily say that those creative rooms at Marvel were, you know, we could have easily have all had the biggest egos in comics, but we didn't, right? Everybody there it was, was just confident. Well. We were yeah. confident, but there was no one there who was like the asshole in the room, mm -hmm. right? There was no, and everybody had their own personality, right? Like, mm -hmm. like I remember Straczynski was very stoic. Joe would be just sit there listening. And <laughs> then like, a couple hours later, he'd be like, what about this? And we would all go, fuck, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, Jeff had his role, you had your role, Brian had, and we bickered a lot and it was all in good fun. Nobody walked away angry, but it was, it was always, it was always with one goal in mind. It wasn't like, Hey, what can I do that's going to service my story and make my story bigger? It was like, how do we make this all bigger? And by virtue of that, oh shit, my story just got bit. I, I mean, how many ideas did, did you and I throw Brian and Brian throw us and that we used in other things, right? I mean, it just, it was just constantly back and forth on this stuff mm -hmm. um 
And that's the beauty of it. So I love that shit. I love mm. doing that stuff, you know, and I continue to do that stuff. Um, you know, I, I wish I could, you know, I, I really can't talk a lot about the Amazon thing because, you know, it's, you know, it's their company. It's not mine. It's, um, a, it's, a, good one, it's a good one to end on, though, Job. Like, yeah. not to be sentimental. I hate to say this to your face, but you are so instrumental in where my life went. You know, I mean, I remember in my 20s being broke. And in my thirties, having quite a lot of money, suddenly, yeah. you know, and it led to the luck that came in my forties and so on, you know. So, and none of it would have happened without you, you, and, you and Bill James were so instrumental. Did you say well, you know, everything's a roll of the dice, isn't it? You know, it's a roll of the dice. Uh, but but ge genuinely, I, th I think you're one of the most important pivotal figures in comics. And we talked about this. I was talking about this with a pal today, actually, who said to me, "Like Joe and Jimmy be Marvel Knights, you know, and then you and Bill with with." Marvel in 2000, you know, you literally saved the business. I think the business was going under and you guys saved it. And I just want to say on behalf of everybody, thanks very much. Thanks, man. <laughs> you know, I, you look at it that way. I look at it as I think Kevin Smith saved the business. I think Kevin was instrumental in that too. But I think it was, it was really, you know, there, there is, you know, the, the changeover. I mean, you know, Ike Perlmutter came in. He brought in Bill. Bill brought in me. Then later on, we had we had a Dan Buckley and Alan Fine. It was a whole team of people that came in, and and there were different layers of, of people that came in at different times to just boost success. It was, you know, I mean, the only thing I can say is I, I was I was kind of a constant during there, uh, and you know, I had my ups and downs with management at Marvel too. I mean, there, there was you know, there were you know there were some crazy times uh, where we were you know fighting for certain stories and things like that, but. But ultimately, uh, that whole, com you know, it's a combination, certain combinations breed success. And we just, we were very, very fortunate to have just the right mix of creatives and artists that, that were there at the, at the, at the, at this one nexus, you know, mm -hmm. and we did, we did some good books, you know, and, and uh, I remember, you know, when, when you, when you started Mark as a writer, what was, I'm going to assume you're goal oriented, just like I am, right? What, what did you, to you, what did you say, if someday I could do some, this project like this person, what was that project that you'd say, if I could do that? Oh, then. for me, Superman, yeah, 100%. I mean, that was my goal is something right. you love as a kid. I think we all do that, don't we? We, we want to do the thing we love as kids. Right. So, so to me, right, you know, I... I got reintroduced to comics. I dropped them as a, as a, as at 12 years old, I dropped comics. And I got reintroduced to comics when I was 25. And I got reintroduced by reading Dark Knight and Watchmen. Mm -hmm. So to me, my goal was someday I'm going to write or draw or write and draw something as good as those books. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, that wasn't going to happen f for anybody, really. Right. Because mm -hmm. they were of a time and a place. Right. It's, it's like no one can recreate could do with Sergeant Pepper's Rolling Hearts Club Band, yeah. right? Because it was 1967 when that shit happened. So, but that was always what I aspired to. And, you know, uh, and we're talking to a friend of mine and, and saying, you know, I never quite, you know, I mean, it ain't over for me, but I never quite hit the goal, got to the aspiration, you know, did okay. And my buddy said, uh, I, I would beg to disagree. I think if you... If you look at your entire tenure at Marvel and put it all together, he's like, maybe that's your Watchmen. I'm like, oh, mm, that's a good okay. way of looking at it. It's just, yeah. it's just a different way of looking at it. Yeah. And you know, uh, I don't think it is, but you know, he from his perception, he's like, I perceive it as Watchmen. He's and and he was talking about the books that you and Brian and Straczynski and Loeb and that whole group, right? I mean, fucking, we had Josh Sweden on X Men, dude. Yeah. You know, sorry. That's my, uh, sorry. That's, that's what Joss Whedon walks in again. It's just one of those right, moments. Right, right. <laughs> um, I, I mean, we, we had, we had Damon Lindelof, man. Yeah. yeah. We had Hulk versus Wolverine. We had some tremendous talents walking crazy. through those halls. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't write those books, but, you know, I kind of stood there like the Queen of England and, and waved. So, <laughs> um, so to him, because he was reading all that stuff, he said that that was like, it was like a monthly watchman, you know, multiple watchmen that were coming out. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, that's kind of cool, you know, to be a part of that. Um, so for that, you know, I will always be 
indebted and 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 and, and love you guys. You know, so this, this is getting really way too. It's, it's, this is it's like a Tinder date online or it's something. Like this yeah. It's just like, oh, God, please, guys, just just <laughs> get room. You know. Um, but we've seen Act One. I look forward to Act Two, Joe. You know, this is very exciting. I can't yeah, wait. You know, you it's, it's well, actually this. This I think it's Act Three because Act One was was you know freelancer event. Comics. I guess Act so. The, the yeah, was, the yeah this is Act yeah, Three. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't want there to be an Act Four because I want Act Three to really kind of kick ass. <laughs> you know what I mean, um, so thanks, Ben. This has been, this has been fun. See. You great, know, great catch. Not yeah, we're going to keep it to an hour because I know uh, I, I always try and keep it to an hour and it ends up nearly two. You know, so. gotta chop these up. Gotta chop I mean, these up. I mean. right? Listen, don't worry, we will, we will. We're going to find we're all gonna, the best. We're going to find some cliffhangers. So let me tell you the story. Well, I'll uh, just say me, good, I'll say my goodbye to you before you give me the gossip, and then we can do the job. <laughs> right, 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 Thanks right. very much. I'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.